What's up, everyone? I hope you're as excited as I am to talk a whole bunch about muscle hypertrophy. Before we get started, I need to apologize. I know my voice sounds a bit weird. I've just been dealing with a couple of weeks of a very, very nasty case of the gains. Yeah, I know. You loved it. Well, if you like my friend Chris here, and you like me, right? Every one of us that I know is interested in some point to maximize their muscle gains. And you may be thinking to yourself, hey, Andy, I know that muscle physiology is your area of expertise. You study how muscle fibers grow, shrink, die, and repair in your lab, and you've been doing that for a decade. But you may not realize I actually used to be a competitive bodybuilder back in the day. In fact, I was actually pretty famous before there was even Instagram and those things, and I used to get fans come up to me all the time asking me for pictures. And, and you can see like a good example of that here. This guy ran up and was like, hey man, can I get a double biceps picture? And I'm like, sure. You know, so I, I was kind enough to take a picture of him with it. And um, yeah, anyways, you, if you, you, you want to actually see a picture of me in my, one of my competitions? All right, well, here it is. I was a little more tan and just a little, you know, a little bit more muscular in this picture here. But this is, this is a local uh, meet that I did one time. I didn't win, you know, obviously, like, but I got second place, so it was pretty good. Well, anyways, uh, you know, humans in, in general, we've been interested in strength training and gaining muscle for a really long time. In fact, there's documents suggesting that we've been lifting muscle or lifting weights for the purpose of growing muscle since the seventh century. And there's a really cool article here um, by the famous sport historian Jan Todd on the history of barbells and dumbbells and when women started lifting with dumbbells and things like that that I encourage you to explore. But we've actually been studying muscle growth um, with exercise for almost 100 or over 100 years now. The first study came out uh, in the late 1800s by a German scientist. And he actually threw a couple of dogs um, on a treadmill. What he did is he actually cut one of their sartorius muscles out of their leg, put them on a treadmill for two months, and then looked at how much their other sartorius grew and found about a 50% increase in hypertrophy after just treadmill running for a couple of months. So the point being... We've spent a lot of time and effort as a society, as scientists, and as individuals trying to understand how to maximize muscle growth for a very long time. And if you've been up to date with the field or you've seen any of my previous work, especially some of my podcasts with Barbell Shrugged and stuff years ago, uh, you may feel like you got a pretty good grip on the science. But what I want to actually do and the reason I'm making all these videos is we have learned a tremendous amount in the last three years alone on what muscle hypertrophy actually is, what causes it, and then how to then maximize it with your training and hypertrophy. So I've decided to do this giant video series on all things hypertrophy. In part one, like I said, I'll describe some of the newest things we've learned in just the last couple of years. In fact, several of the things I've included in that video came out just within a month of me filming this. So I'll talk in depth about what, what we know uh, scientifically about what actually is muscle hypertrophy, what parts grow, which ones don't, how much, etc. Part two, then I'll get into the stimuli, the causes, the molecular mechanisms. If you like the biochemistry piece, uh, the, the molecular biology side of it, video two is your jam. And then part three is when I'll specifically get into the eating and training to maximize. So if you just want the practical applications, you want to know how much volume you should be hitting, what order to do your exercises in, frequency, uh, what type, eccentric, concentric, um, drop sets, pyramids, which ones work better, all that stuff, that's all in video three. But I actually, I think you should start with at least video two because you'll never really truly understand uh, how to train to optimize growth if you don't understand what's causing your body to want to grow muscle in the first place. Um, what I'll also do is I'll try to chop these up into some five minute ones as well, but if you want the full jam, my strongest recommendation, start at one, go to two, go to three, and you'll all understand as much as we could possibly give you on all things muscle hypertrophy. Okay, enjoy. Let's have a fun ride here and let's get a little bit more jacked. Right? Maybe I should stop. I don't know, what would I look better at? Welcome back everyone. This is part two of my epic three-part series on all the newest, latest, most groundbreaking research available on all things skeletal muscle hypertrophy. Now, if you're a super muscle nerd and you're thinking, Part two, I missed part one. Go back and check that out now. I cover all the basics of the physiology, the, the structure, what part of the muscle grows, what have we learned in the last one, two, and even three years about where, what areas grow, which ones don't, why, etc. That's a big long look about the detail, the microscopic, macroscopic, and what we call ultrastructural 
uh, look at the muscle itself. In this part, I'm going to talk about the stimulation. So what do we actually have to do? What has to happen inside our body to cause the muscle to want to grow? The third part is when I'll get into the, all the specific practical recommendations. So how to train, uh, what rest intervals to use, what rep range, what type of lifting, uh, how much to eat, protein, all that stuff. So part one is basic physiology. Part two here is the cascade of stimulation. Part three is the training and eating. Now, I think it's important that you watch this one even before you watch part three. So if you're not interested in, in the physiology part, cool. But I think you should watch this video prior to jumping to video three because you're never really going to understand how to train unless you understand how to cause the signal for growth. So, so the reason you grow is because something signaled the tissue to do that. So when you understand this part, it makes part three a lot easier. So hopefully I've convinced you to stick around if you're just looking for the practical recommendations. I promise I'll keep you interested for here. If you're one of my students, you don't have a choice. you got to watch it anyways. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's start talking about part two here, stimulating muscle growth. And what I really mean, uh, I can expand on stimulating when I'm talking about what are the signals, the sensors, and stimuli that induce skeletal muscle hypertrophy. And I should even clarify a little bit here, and I won't say this again, but I'm really talking about resistance exercise-induced muscle growth. So I'm not talking about other things, right? So you're trying to lift weights to add some muscle. That's what we're focusing on in these videos. All right, I want to start off with, with a, a really awesome quote from uh, an article that I'll talk about a lot here, but it is lot in this presentation, right? It's, it's the muscle hypertrophy stimuli that will induce the hypertrophic signal transduction and result in hypertrophy. Thus, if we know the actual acute stimuli, then we can measure with the goal of identifying interventions that maximally induce these signal. In other words, it's important that we just don't do studies where one group lifts this way and another group lifts this way and see who got bigger. We want to know how to actually cause it, especially um, if we want to get to that next level of muscle growth, it's important we pay attention to the signal. So a basic outline of what we're going to cover in this video will be this. Okay, I'll talk about what are what I call the five steps to activate muscle growth. We'll go over the three mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy and what we got wrong. So if any of you following along or seen my previous videos, who have seen us talk about that. Uh, that's been something that has been around for a while, but we have a lot more update information on uh, those mechanisms. We'll talk about, of course, testosterone and IGF-1, if you're familiar with that, DOMS, negative, eccentric, and what's called exercise-induced muscle damage, uh, mechanoreceptors, metabolic stress, hypoxia, blood flow restriction, uh, the pump, the burn, all that stuff. We'll talk about cell signaling, gene expression, and protein synthesis, the 141 muscle genes that regulate, or the genes that regulate muscle growth, uh, training and any implications a little bit, although that's mostly in part three. And then the last one is a little bit of magic and voodoo that you have to understand to be able to maximize your muscle growth. So let's go ahead and dive right into it and start talking some biochemistry and molecular biology. All right, so in order to cause your muscles to want to grow, you have to initiate and actually succeed this five-step muscle growing system. And it looks like this. There has to be some sort of sufficient signal that has to be translated into signaling, that has to induce some sort of expression of genes, and then you go through the protein synthesis process. And none of that matters unless you have the critical step number five, which is a secret. And I'll tell you as the video goes on. So let's go ahead and take a look at all these five steps in detail, and let's talk about what we know scientifically about them and what, maybe what we don't know. So step number one is the stimulus. And I didn't say stimulant. Uh, get it? Coffee, stimulant. I said stimulus. What I mean by that is, if you go back and you watch part one of our series, um, or if you just thought about that, you realize that all of your muscles are actually made up of millions of individual muscle cells. And at the outskirt of that muscle is called a sarcolemma, or what we will generally call a cell membrane. Okay, it's the outside. And what we know now is the vast majority of the communication of what happens in the cell is a result of some stimuli hitting the cell membrane, or the outside of the sarcolemma. So in this case, if you want to grow muscle, Something has to talk to the cell, and the best way to do that is to have some sort of insult on the cell wall, or the cell membrane, rather. All right, so what does that actually look like? Well, I'm going to take a slight departure, and I'm going to come right back to this, okay? So we've got to lay a little bit of groundwork before we can understand what's really happening here. So back in 10, uh, 2010, rather, a, a young, strapping young scientist named Brad Schoenfeld, published a really famous article at this point. I think it's been cited over a thousand times, which is a, just a mega number, right? It's just ridiculous. 
And he speculated that there was three primary mechanisms that cause muscle growth. Number one would be mechanical tension, number two, metabolic stress, and three, muscle damage. And I'll give Brad some credit here. He, this was a pretty impressive paper and a pretty impressive hypothesis. Well, we've learned a lot in the next last nine years. So some of what Brad suggested was right and some of it wasn't quite on. But uh, he and his team actually combined with um, a couple of other folks you can see here, Henning Wackerhagen, and Henning has just done an incredible amount of work on the biology and the biochemistry of muscle uh, hypertrophy. So he, anything you read from Henning is going to be just amazing. The molecular side, he's just got it crushed. Um, so they came out with a paper just recently and said, okay, what's the update stimuli and sensors that cause muscle growth? So I'd recommend you go check out this paper if you'd like, uh, but I'll break it down, break it down here and give you the very short version. And here's basically what they said. We'll start off with mechanical tension. Now, what's that mean? Well, we know that the cell has what are called mechanosensors. So these are, and I'll, and I'll show you what these look like in a second, but these are sensors along that sarcolemma or cell wall. And the, pri the two primary ones kind of within that subcategory of mechanosensors that probably play the biggest role in inducing muscle hypertrophy or stimulating it are the costumeres and the second group of one. Now, we have a decent amount of evidence that the costumeres are playing um, a role in, in this mechanoreceptor thing. The next one is called that, this filamin m torque autophagy kind of cascade. And we don't really know what that means yet. So it, this may play a role, it may not. You're gonna have to check back in a few years. It's kind of undefined and it's been tossed out there, but it really hasn't been super well described. So we're gonna have to come back on that one. For the most part though, like I said, the customers are pretty well described. Um, and we know that those are activated with a lot of things, even as simple as something as simple as just cell swelling. So edema, water gets in there, the cell gets larger, the customers kick on, it starts transducing that signal. So how does this fall under the mechanical tension umbrella? We know that if you do things that are kind of quote unquote heavy, so this would be anything greater than 30% of your one rep max, and certainly things above 60%. Well, we know that that causes stress on the cell wall, right? You're causing the cell to contract. That's, that contraction activates those costumeres. And that's how mechanical tension, lifting something heavy, translates into a cell signal in the tissue. The heavy thing causes the cell walls to contract and move, and that activates these costumeres, which are the mechanical centers mechanical sensors. We also know that motor unit activation is important. So one issue we have quite consistently with the resistance exercise in hypertrophy literature is I'm not fully convinced that you've activated all the muscle fibers. What's that mean? Well, if you did say training at 30% of your one rep max, even if you did the failure, we know that the higher threshold motor units, typically the bigger, larger, faster fibers, aren't actually activated until you get much heavier, probably even above 80, maybe even 90% of your one rep max. So you have a bunch of fibers that really never got activated. So one benefit the mechanical tension has, in other words, lifting heavy, over the next two, like just causing muscle damage or causing metabolic stress, is the fact that you're increasing the likelihood of activating more motor units. If it's not activated, it's not going to hypertrophy. So even if you look at, say, comparing mechanical tension lifting heavy to some of the other methods which I'll describe later, you probably have a higher likelihood of activating growth in more total fibers by spending some time activating those motor units, okay? Uh, in addition, this could all simply be a stretch issue, right? So we know that stretching itself of, the, of that sarcolemma, that cell wall can activate those costumeres and cause uh, a decent amount of muscle hypertrophy as well. Since we're talking about stretch, we know that can actually activate muscle growth through a different mechanism, which is muscle damage. So by simply stretching the cell wall, you can cause damage and that alone can activate this cascade of muscle growth. So because of that, uh, we know that DOMS are delayed onset muscle soreness. So the soreness you have in your muscles a day or two after lifting uh, is also associated with causing some sort of muscle hypertrophy. Now, we have to be careful here because, and, and hopefully if you've been paying attention uh, to any of the things I've done the last five years or so, we know that there's only a very modest and probably even lower than that, a, a low correlation between the amount of damage you get and the amount of growth you get. So if you're going through a workout and you're thinking, if I get more sore tomorrow than I did last time, that means I'm getting more growth. And we just simply know that that's not true. So the amount of soreness you get is only very loosely associated with how much growth you get. Okay, so we want to be careful of just chasing damage and chasing the soreness. Right. But muscle damage is also associated with things like the pump, right? So if you're trying to get a bigger pump on a muscle, causing a little bit more damage, then that's 
it's going to be related to muscle growth. Uh, same with edema, like I said. So you can get a lot of cell swelling. In fact, most of the research now suggests that's probably explaining more of the DOMS than the actual like tissue tearing. I'm not really convinced that happens a ton in normal circumstances. It's probably just the edema that's going on there. As well, it's what they call exercise-induced muscle damage. Okay, all of these things are in the same umbrella of causing some sort of physical trauma or stress, whether it be actually ruining the, the myofilaments or just causing swelling, things like that. And again, they, they're not, it's not a direct relationship with any of these things to muscle growth, but there is an association here pretty clearly. And so because of that, we see things like eccentric training, um, any extra range of motion training. So if you're typically not used to going to a certain depth um, or range of motion in any of your joints, and that's going to induce a little bit more muscle soreness than usual, as well as any novelty. So novelty could be, again, a different exercise, could be a different range of motion, could be a different rep range or intensity um, that you're not used to. Those all are associated with increasing the amount of muscle damage. Okay. Now, if we finish off this concept then of, with metabolic stress, this could be a whole host of things like hypoxia. So we have recent evidence coming out showing does this simply being in a hypoxic state can activate this cascade of muscle growth. Uh, other things are sort of because of this, th this explains why things like the, uh, also the pump, but also the burn and stuff, right? So you've heard people say like, if you're not getting a pump in a muscle and it's not burning at all, you're very likely to be causing um, muscle growth. And that's somewhat true, right? Because of this association with metabolic stress. It also explains how things like high repetition and low rest. So, you know, set to 25, set to 50, set to 100, whatever, with low rest intervals or the combination, can induce a decent amount of muscle hypertrophy. And it also explains two fun more concepts like blood flow restriction training. So with blood flow restriction training, the load is incredibly light. Again, you're, you're talking, well, maybe, you know, 30% of your 100 max at best, perhaps even significantly lower. There's very little, if any, muscle damage, but yet it still enables an equal amount, if not greater amount of muscle growth. Okay, and the last one there is what I call kind of the, the aerobic exercise slash interval gains conflict. And so if you look again across the literature, you'll see quite a bit of actual muscle hypertrophy as a result of just endurance training or interval training, things like that. And we now know that that's probably because it induced a significant amount of metabolic stress and that in and of itself, especially if you're untrained, sedentary, or poorly trained, may cause muscle growth. Okay, at least initially in your training. After that, it, it won't, but the initial stuff will work. Okay, now you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, what about testosterone? I, I, as soon as you started talking about stimulators of muscle growth and, and the things that activated, I was totally expecting you to see testosterone. Where are the hormones on this list? Well, it's not, it doesn't work exactly how you think it does. So clearly testosterone is anabolic and it is a clear part of the anabolic cascade, but it is not a linear thing. So it's a bit of a yes and no here. In other words, uh, say you did one workout and you measured your testosterone afterwards and then you did another workout and your testosterone was, was 20% higher after that workout. That will not mean you have a 20% more growth after that workout. In fact, there is a very poor, if any, association between the amount of testosterone and the amount of muscle growth. They are very poorly correlated, right? Again, if at all. Now, what am I not saying? I'm not saying if you take your testosterone out that you'll still grow equally, not even close. I'm also not saying that exogenous testosterone won't increase growth. It clearly, clearly, clearly does. Okay, But you can't walk around and measure someone's testosterone and say, okay, you're going to grow more than I am because you have more testosterone. If your normal testosterone levels are 40% higher than mine, I may still be able to grow more muscle than you do faster. It's not really relevant to the equation. Right? Where it becomes helpful, again, is the exogenous use of testosterone because you can put in orders of magnitude more testosterone than you would have endogenously. So that's when it starts to matter. So clearly, again, yes, uh, testosterone has a role in binding to the cell wall and activating muscle growth, but it's not nearly as tight as one would think. This is, we've seen this across many domains, right? We've also, this is exactly why women who have much lower testosterone still have no problem causing muscle hypertrophy. Uh, elderly fo elder folks, or even middle-aged folks who have uh, reduced amounts of testosterone um, compared one person to the next person, again, who has higher, who has lower. None of those things seem to matter, and they can all have equal amounts of resulting hypertrophy, suggesting the testosterone is not playing that critical role that some think it does in the way that people think it does. Okay, so moving on then, uh, kind of coming back to our original point here. 
the first thing that has to happen is we have to get some sort of stimulus on that cell wall. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that would actually be. And here you go. Now this is kind of the same graphic I used in part one uh, to describe a muscle cell. So just imagine that being a muscle cell. Well, along the outside of the wall, the sarcolemma there, you've got different receptors. And I've got different colors here. And we're going to take a look at these in more detail. So let's imagine you had some green, pink, and then black receptors. Say the ones that are in green are your mechanosensors. And those things, again, are going to sense your stretch or your muscle damage or your edema. Right? Uh, but maybe the ones that are pink are the ones that sense your anabolic hormones, testosterone, um, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is another highly anabolically associated hormone. And then the ones in black look at things like metabolic stress, uh, hypoxia, lactate. We know lactate is a pretty potent signaler of muscle growth. Same thing, right? So we understand quite a bit now that there are different ways that we can signal the muscle uh, to grow. And it's probably all these different things. So if we come back and take a look at a summary slide I had in part one, if you're seeing this and you're like, what is all this? Go back and watch part one. But my basic point is this. Even saying the term muscle hypertrophy is a little bit nonspecific because there are different ways your muscle can grow. And so while we are starting to understand more and more about what parts of the tissue and a part of the, of the cells actually grow and why, what we don't know yet is if different types of training cause different types of hypertrophy. So the classic example here, and this is the short version, is you have contractile hypertrophy versus sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So the, the elements that contract in your muscle that cause force increasing versus sarcoplasmic, which would be the non-contractile elements. So perhaps some type of training causes the muscle to grow in a way that would allow it to also produce more force. Perhaps other types of training cause it to grow in a method that increases the size, but doesn't necessarily mean it can contract with any more force. If that even happens, we're not sure. And so then we're st certainly not sure at all about how the stimuli would, di would differ, right? So why is it this rep range causes this type of uh, adaptation and this rep range causes this type of adaptation? We aren't anywhere close to knowing the answers to those things. So um, we know it's gotta be a stimuli thing, right? They're clearly getting different signals. Well, what, how do those signals differ? Is one maybe working with the mechanoreceptors and another working with um, the hypoxia? We don't know any of that stuff yet. So more information to learn, and I guess a new video for me to make five or 10 years from now, whenever we get that information, if we ever do. Okay, so let's assume though, regardless, somehow you successfully completed step one and you induced some sort of signal. From there, our cascade is a little bit more clear in terms of what has to happen. You have to go on to step two, which is what we call our signaling cascade. Okay, now this happens in the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is the inside of the cell, sarcolemma being the wall, cytoplasm being the inside. And this happens through a whole bunch of molecules that we call signaling proteins. So these signaling molecules are an entire host of different proteins whose job is to communicate some sort of signal from the cell wall, which we now know to actually really be these receptors, all the way through the cytoplasm and to the nucleus so we can tell your cell how to respond. So before we talk about these in more detail, let's look at what that actually means because I remember as a student, hearing this term protein and, and not really understanding what it meant. And I thought I did, but I would be so confused. I'm like, you told me this is a protein. How is this a protein, etc. So I want to look at what that phrase even means to begin with. And you have to realize you have a whole host of different types of proteins in your body. Now, we as exercise scientists and stuff tend to think of um, the structural ones. So we think of protein, we think of actin, we think of myosin, and those are built of proteins. Sure, but you also have to realize all of your enzymes are proteins all of your receptors, so the things I'm talking about, these receptors on the cell wall, they're all also made of protein. Uh, your antibodies, your neuropeptides, all that stuff, these are all made of proteins. And so some really helpful examples you can see at the bottom there. Um, you probably remember keratin. That's the thing that makes up your hair and nails. That's a protein, right? Hemoglobin, the thing that carries all the oxygen in your blood is a protein. Insulin, you know what that does, right? Pepsin, which is kind of a digestive aid. Well, not kind of, it is a digestive aid. These are all different proteins. In fact, you have about 100,000 different types of proteins in your body. So if we come back to this slide, these specific set of proteins, and then there's a whole bunch of them, there's thousands of them, their job is to convey a signal. So we collectively call them signaling proteins. So that's what that phrase means. So again, what it would look like, they sit there, one, one of them anyways, sits right next to the cell wall and sees, hey, the cell wall's been stretched. 
or it's been there's been hypoxia or there's been damage there or there's been contraction or there's lactate bound there or testosterone is bound there or any of the things that we just got done talking about that cause the signal to happen it would see that in the receptor the receptor would hit that protein if you will that protein would hit another protein and protein and protein and protein and those things would cascade all the way down to the nucleus okay we would call that the anabolic signaling cascade and probably the most famous one is called mTOR and that's one particular protein that we know is very highly associated with muscle anabolism or muscle hypertrophy okay now we're learning more and more about mTOR and, and all the details of it later but again I'll just simply say at this point it is highly associated with the anabolic process okay so once you've activated all those proteins and then one protein activated another one and then another one activated mTOR and that activated another one eventually one of them would hit the nucleus and that's the part of the cell that holds your DNA and that's important because that's what's going to tell your cell to grow, shrink, die, repair, whatever else it wants it to do. So within the nucleus, like I said, you've got your DNA. So this is the stuff you inherited from mom and dad. So you may have the DNA to code for a whole host of different proteins. How do you code for those proteins? How do you start building them? Well, it depends on what signal has been transduced to the nucleus. Right? So this is why this cascade is so important. Right? Now, going into this a little bit more detail, because um, it's actually kind of fun. So I, I kind of outlined one signaling cascade, but there's a couple of other general categories I think you should be aware of. So I talked about uh, this anabolic one, and it's typically the anabolic cascade is more specifically the, the P13K AKT mTOR one. So there's a bunch of different proteins along that. So one activates another one, activates another one down there. Well, we also have a catabolic cascade, right? So you have to have some signal to grow. You're also going to have some signal that says, hey, break some tissue down. Uh, that could happen because, say, the, the, the muscle cell is damaged because you're lifting and you want to break it down and get rid of all the, the non-functioning proteins and the things that have been misshaped and misfold. Well, that has to be a catabolic process, right? And so you can see the FOXO, um, the nf calpha b the, 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 that's a very common catabolic cascade as well. And then you also have something in the middle, which is a little bit more fun, um, which is an inhibitor. So now this is a cascade. It's not anabolic. It doesn't cause muscle to grow. It's not catabolic either. It doesn't cause you to break down. But it's an inhibitor. So what it, its job is to block the anabolic process. And this is very, 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 very important because unblocked tissue growth is cancer. That's a tumor, right? So you want to be able to grow tissue, but you also want to be able to say, oh, okay, let's, I want to stop growth in this case. There's too much going on. And that's not necessarily the same thing as just breaking down the current tissue. It's blocking the growth process. So it's a very important break you have on that gas pedal, if you will. And by far the most common or most famous or infamous one is called myostatin. Okay? And in fact, you can see, you can Google around and see more and more photos, but uh, we, we've seen now plenty of animals, in, and there are humans if you're wondering, who are born without the genes to code for the myostatin protein. And so you can see what happens to these folks. These are not animals that have been, getting, been given steroids. They're not been given uh, special antibiotics or something like that. They just naturally had a mutation. They're, they're X-Men, if you will, right? We all have mutations, right? So some mutations make you have different eye color and maybe you grow taller than your mom or whatever it happens to be. Well, their mutation happened to be they didn't have the gene or enough of the gene to program for enough of the protein to build enough myostatin and so they weren't able to check muscle growth enough and so they get huge so you can see roger the kangaroo, kangaroo there uh the, the famous cow and then the bull weevil the, the dog there so that's what myostatin would do um, of course you may be thinking wait a minute can i then buy myostatin inhibitors mm, i'll let you look into that maybe maybe not maybe it's legal maybe it's not legal maybe they're legal but they don't work I'll leave it up to you okay that's what signaling cascade really is so if we come back here uh, we've got our nucleus our next step then step three is that gene expression process so the, the signaling has happened the DNA has to go there now to give you a very quick review of again your basic biology here gene expression means this you all know you have you know like what is it uh, three billion base pairs, right? And you've got around 20,000 different genes in your body. What is a gene per se? Well, a gene is just a sequence of DNA or RNA, in this case, mostly DNA, that encodes the synthesis of a specific RNA product. 
In other words, this chunk of the DNA codes for this particular protein. All right. So what it could look like is this. Um, you know that the A, T, G, C thing, right? And those are all your nucleotide base pairs. So in this particular example, you can see that, say, uh, ATA. ATA comes together. What that means is when you replicate ATA from your RNA, then you code it for a particular amino acid called I. Okay, great. So you take your nucleotide base pairs, you replicate them, you make a whole bunch of amino acids. You take those amino acids, put them together, a bunch of those, you call that a peptide. You take a bunch of those peptides together, and now you've got a protein. All right? And so that's what I'm really showing you here. So that the eventual combination of the amino acids makes a protein. And the red red sequences that you're seeing here would be the gene. So you can imagine these line of code just running, 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 running here. Well, this particular sequence, the red to red, is a whole bunch of nucleotides that then code for a whole bunch of very specific amino acids. And that very specific amino acid sequence makes a very specific protein. Okay? So that's how you can go into your DNA and say, hey, we need to build this protein. And it can say, oh, okay, I know the line of code to start with and to stop with to build the specific amount and sequence, in other words, order of amino acids to get that protein you want. And there you go. Okay? So it would look like this. And you have your DNA. You go through this transcription process, which makes it into RNA, but eventually you make some amino acids. And then from there, you combine those into making your appropriate protein. So I know I cut a lot of stuff out of that. I'm just trying to give you that quick reminder and so you let you visualize and see it a little bit of how the process works. So a really, really interesting paper just came out uh, this year, I believe. Um, Stu Phillips was a part of that, but it was a large amount of authors. And they ran just an incredible amount of um, really high-level science on this stuff and found that they believe there's about 141 different genes that are now associated with muscle growth. So in order to grow your muscle, it doesn't just come from one, it's about 140. And that's actually pretty awesome because uh, that list could have been a whole lot higher. Now that we know that, we can start doing more targeted therapies to just see if we can activate those gene sequences specifically more or less. But really, really, really cool stuff. So of the, again, 20,000 genes or whatever you have, nobody really knows. Um, probably only about 140 of those are responsible for all your gains. If you want, here's an actual image of them, so it's a really nice thing. I'm not going to walk you through this video, but they also show you what happens kind of with aging to those genes and insulin sensitivity and then some other stuff. So really impressive work by that group. Nice job. So now that you understand step three, let's move on to step four. Okay, you've activated the genes, your 141 different ones are going, and now we actually have to synthesize the protein. And that happens in the ribosome most specifically. So if you're unfamiliar with that, those are a whole bunch of other little organelles within your body, and this is basically their job is protein synthesis. So they would kind of come on the back end of the nucleus and they say, okay, you want to replicate these genes? Got it. You go through the process we just got done describing, but we're the ones that are going to actually build the proteins. So let's imagine this. You had a protein over here that you want to grow. Let's call that myosin. So if you remember from part one, the first video in this series, that's kind of what a myosin would look like. Right? And the myosin is one of the myofilaments in your, in your muscles, right? And you want to grow that. You want to make that thing larger. Okay, great. You did the stimulus. You got the um, protein cascade going. You got the DNA expression. And now you're trying to build that protein. This is what it would look like. All right? And this would be your protein synthesis process. You would take those amino acids, whatever they happen to be, you would ship them to the ribosomes. The ribosomes would then start combining them together and it would spit out that particular protein. And so it would start doing this. Okay, great. Continue to feed me amino acids and I will continue to take these things and build them together into your whole functioning protein. And so the size of that myosin then continues to grow and grow and grow as long as you feed it amino acids. In step three, or part three rather of these videos, I will talk about what specific foods that needs to be, what type of amino acids, et cetera, et cetera, to maximize that, right? So if you do the right, if you do the right training, you'll maximize steps one through three or four. And if you have the right nutrients, then step four will also be able to be maximized. All right, again, just to show you some fun stuff here, you can see in the column kind of on the edge there, different amino acid sequences. And this particular one, that's what myosin looks like, right? So it is that specific amino acid sequence that you'll get to build that particular protein. Okay, 
We also need to talk a little bit about overall protein balance because we tend to assume that if you're going through protein synthesis that you're growing more muscle, you're getting bigger, and that's not the case. So what we have to understand is what we call overall protein balance. So at all times, your body is doing a little bit of protein synthesis and it's also doing a little bit of protein breakdown. So what you care about is what's the balance. So if I'm gaining five but I'm losing 10, my net is actually negative five. Not good, or the opposite here, right? So we see different scenarios that can happen, right? You can see that the first section over there, and I'm not gonna walk you through the basic math, but you get the idea here, right? So we need to focus on not only maximizing protein synthesis, but also then minimizing protein breakdown so that our, our overall balance is where we want it to be, okay? Now, where you can get tricked, you can see products and commercials um, and other marketing schemes that'll say things like, we have scientifically measured our supplement and it does this with protein synthesis. And you're like, great, then there's no way it doesn't cause me to grow muscle. But if they don't describe to you what happened on the breakdown side of it, then you don't know at all what your balance could look like. So be very wary of those things when you're like, wait a minute, I thought HMB didn't work. But yet here's another clinical trial showing that it increased protein synthesis by 40%. Ah, but did they measure protein breakdown? No, they didn't. Well, then I don't really know what's going to actually happen to my overall tissue. And the vast majority of studies will not measure protein breakdown. And fair enough, it's, it's pretty difficult to do. Protein synthesis is pretty easy to measure. But nonetheless, something to keep in mind. So um, I'm visually depicting a, a really a fairly famous review article that came out about 20 years ago now. And what they said is, all right, let me present to you some different scenarios. And I want you to tell me whether or not that scenario would be a net result in muscle hypertrophy, so growth and gains, anabolic, or a net result in atrophy or catabolic or muscle loss. And our first scenario is this. So as you sit there at rest, what's happening? Are you growing muscle? Or are you losing muscle? Turns out at rest, you're fairly catabolic, right? So you're actually going down the wrong direction. Right after, immediately after, say the most perfectly designed strength training bout for hypertrophy, you're still actually pretty negative. Well, you're negative overall. Now, what's interesting is, was the stimulus anabolic? Yes, because it moved you more towards the anabolic, but in and of itself wasn't enough to get you into a net positive balance. And that's, again, the trickery there, right? So it was anabolic, it moved you up closer, but it wasn't enough to put you over the threshold of net positive balance. What about just protein alone, if you just had a high protein meal? Well, it turns out that is a pretty potent anabolic signal, and so it will move you there. And what's nice about that is these signals from strength training as well as protein seem to be additive, right? And so what I mean is the bump you get from resistance exercise combined with the separate bump from protein means you're really, really high in the anabolic window. So it's pretty clear that you need to have some protein around when that signal is there to maximize your growth. That doesn't mean per se you have to have your protein shake immediately after your workout, but you need to have amino acids available when that signal, that molecular signal, that gene expression, that protein synthesis signal are high. If they're, if they're high and you have no supply, you're not gonna grow. If they then die down and then you finally bring the supply in, you're minimizing your window. You're not maximizing your gains. Well, it turns out if you had carbohydrate to that list, you go even higher up the scale. And so it's pretty clear that the vast majority of time you're gonna be recommended to have protein and carbohydrate around to maximize muscle growth. And in fact, even because of this, just to complete the picture, uh, protein and carbohydrate alone, independent of the strength training, would be there. So it's no surprise for decades and decades that bodybuilders trying to maximize their growth are gonna do their strength training, have protein and carbohydrate, not only around their workout, but then also as much as they can throughout the day. All right. Now I do have a separate video entirely on the post-exercise anabolic window. I think it's a 25 minute version. So you can go check that out if you want more detail there. So I'm not gonna waste your time here. But the kind of highlight or take home point there, increases in synthesis following amino acid feeding only happens if the essential amino acids are ingested. So this slide I just showed you is assuming we're talking about essential amino acids, right? This is not gonna come from eating broccoli. It's not gonna come from eating low quality protein sources. You've got to have the essential amino acids and specifically leucine threshold has to be hit. Okay, now another thing we need to keep in mind here as well is 
I described this in video one, but to come into it shortly here, we have a little bit of what I call a scaling problem. So be very careful because the amount of acute protein synthesis or MPS is not going to actually match the amount of actual muscle growth. So if you looked at a study or something, you found, wow, eating uh, tacos after a workout increased protein synthesis by 30%. You will not see then 30% growth in your muscle. It doesn't work like that. In fact, the number is probably significantly lower. So you can't really take things and say, oh, okay, this one had a higher rate of muscle protein synthesis and then guarantee it will equal a higher amount of muscle growth. So those numbers don't match up. Now, generally, if something has a higher acute protein synthesis rate, we assume it would lead to a higher amount of muscle growth eventually, but that doesn't always, in fact, very rarely does that lead out, that does that end up being true. So be very careful when interpreting things like that um, into actual ventral muscle growth. All right. So to kind of summarize what I just got done talking about there, if you want to add muscle mass, you have to do the following. Number one, you have to train. There has to be some sort of signal. And we talked about the different ways, stress, tension, or uh, damage, right? Why do you have to train? Because you have to give yourself and your tissue a reason to grow. Okay, then you also have to eat, right? But in order to do that reason to grow, you have to initially, you have to, to have a strong enough signal to go through all three parts of that signaling cascade. So protein signaling, gene expression, and protein synthesis. So say you did a type of training and it was enough to start mTOR activation but it wasn't really enough to convince your nucleus to replicate the gene, then you're not gonna grow. Or maybe you were enough to do that, but you weren't really enough to convince the ribosomes to finish the protein synthesis process, then you're not gonna grow, or you're not gonna grow as maximally as possible. Well, none of that matters if you don't eat sufficiently either, right? So why do you have to eat? Well, you have to have the fuel for two things. Number one, you have to have the fuel to power the training, and that's mostly gonna come from carbohydrates, right? Strength training is powered not by protein, clearly, right? Pro protein is a poor energy source. It's not really by fat. So carbohydrates are your fuel for your training session. And then you also have to fuel the growth process. So remember, when you break apart a bond and chemically, that typically releases energy. Not always, but usually. So when you want to put a bond together, like you want to go through protein synthesis, you want to take amino acids and put them together, that requires you investing energy. So that that part also requires energy, and that comes also from carbohydrate. So if you don't have sufficient carbohydrate around, it's very difficult to then go through the actual cellular process of protein synthesis. And maybe I'll say this differently. Um, I can't promise you that, say somebody in a ketogenic diet, they still can go through protein synthesis, no doubt about it. I just know that you can go through it a lot faster with a high amount of carbohydrate around. And so again, the, the, the assumption with all these videos is that you're trying to maximize muscle growth, not what's the minimum possible to keep some muscle around. That's not really what I'm after. And then number two, so you have to eat you have because you have to have the fuel, but then you have to have the building material. So none of that stuff matters. You have an epic signal, you have the right kind of training, your protein synthesis is ready to go, you got all kinds of fuel, but you don't have the amino acids available. Then there's nothing to put together and synthesize, and especially the essential amino acids. So if we put this together in one visual picture, here's what it would look like. And I'm gonna summarize all of your exercise physiology class in like one minute, okay? So let's say you had some carbohydrate. No, it doesn't matter that it's grain. I'm just picked a random picture of carbohydrates, right? We know that eventually those get broken down in your stomach as glucose. From there, you're gonna make it, transfer that into some, or break that down metabolically into acetyl-CoA. As a result, you give off some carbon dioxide. That acetyl-CoA goes on to the Krebs cycle. You lose a little bit of CO2, but you gain what we call ATP. ATP is then split into ADP and PI, and as a result, that gives off heat and some energy. You use that energy on the myosin head, part one, to cause some contraction, and the muscles moved. Okay, you made that contraction, and that resulted in some sort of stimulus. We've already got done talking about that a lot, right? So on the wall, the cell wall, you got some sort of stimulus. That activated one particular protein, that activated another protein, that activated another protein, and we called that the signaling cascade. That then spoke to the nucleus and told the nucleus, okay, express the genes you have to build the protein for myosin. So then you went through that protein synthesis process and you went from there. Now, in order to complete that process, though, you had to consume some protein. 
Now, again, I know there's fat and salmon. Don't get off track here, folks. So you take that amino acid that you ate, and you don't go through that acetyl-CoA and Krebs cycle thing because we don't use protein for energy. You use that amino acid to just ship it to the tissue as supply. So now that the amino acids are available when you're going through that protein synthesis process, you can take them, slowly start to add them to your myosin chain, and eventually that tissue and that muscle, in this case, gets larger. All right. If you do that properly, you'll go from your skinny little self to your new magnified and jacked self, and you'll have increased most likely the diameter, the amount of myofilaments, but certainly the diameter of the muscle fiber. Now, part one of this series videos described all that process in detail about what actually is growing larger in the muscle cell, but you get it by now. Okay. Now, step five. If you've done all of that right, everything has come together, the last thing you have to accomplish to grow muscle is some sort of magic. I don't know, um, perhaps pay off some like shaman or a voodoo god to create some sort of hex or make some sort of spell and then just hope to the heavens that you grow muscle because I don't know, right? It's, I know some of you are thinking, yep, I've tried like hell to grow muscle. I can't. It's all about step five for me. Well, hey, I feel you. I guess buy, hire a new shaman. The one you got sucks. Fire. Okay. So to kind of finish up what we're talking about here, what are the recommendations we can give? Because I wasn't going to make you watch the whole video and not give you some training recommendations. Here's what you basically have to do. You've got to hit one of those big three stimuli, right? Tension, stress, or damage at least once to three times per week per muscle group, okay? Video three, I'll talk about the volume, how many reps, all that type of stuff. And then in terms of food, you have to be an overall caloric surplus, okay? And then you have to have sufficient protein, which you can see there. If you do all those things, you got a shot to maximizing your muscle group. Now that we've finished our discussion of what we know scientifically about how the muscle actually grows, what actually causes it, what signals it, what stimulates it, it's finally time for us to get to part three. How do I train? How do I eat to maximize the growth? I appreciate you staying along for this ride. I know you've all been dying. In fact, most of you probably aren't even listening to this because you just skipped to part three, but that's okay. I know that I'm special. There's only a, a few amount of us real physiology and, and muscle physiology nerds out there. So to those 600 of you that watch this or something, part one and part two, I got a lot of love for you. All right, and to the three million that are gonna watch part three, Whatever. Learn some science. I'm out of here.